I'm good. <laughs> right. Okay, so I'm, I'm here to talk to you about romance in uh, the Dragon Age games. Not all Bioware games, because of Jake. Um, <laughs> but not the, not the good romances, um, not the perfect ones that work out. And then the Warden and Alistair reign as king and queen of Ferelden and live happily ever after. But the romances in the three Dragon Age games that didn't work out. Um, that dissatisfied and subverted and left me brokenhearted and angry and um, ranting about them to roomfuls of people years later. So um, this whole talk is basically a slideshow of my Bioware video game exes and the ones that got away. I'm not bitter. So I came up with a bunch of different titles for this talk, uh, all of which are apparently song titles. Oh, and with bad romance, because you can't go wrong with Lady Gaga. Um, so, there will be straight up spoilers for Dragon Age Origins and Dragon Age 2. I'll try and keep the spoilers for Inquisition pretty minimal and general. But if you haven't played Inquisition, what are you doing? Why are you here? You should be playing Inquisition. So, let's start at the beginning. Dragon Age Origins. And um, with the, the woman that started it all for me. Morrigan. All right. Jake has heard a lot of this. So, Morrigan, she's a witch. Uh, she's raised outside the norms of human society before you, the warden, comes along. She spends most of her time shape-shifting into various animals and hanging out in a forest. Um, she has a terrible relationship with her mum, who is Captain Janeway. I mean, she's Kate Mulgrew, who <laughs> also plays Captain Janeway, but whatever. Um, and, but she, she has this terrible relationship because she thinks her mum is planning to possess her and use her body as a vessel to extend her own life. So, you know, issues. Also, she's voiced by Claudia Black. This is Claudia Black. She plays Erin Soon in Farscape. Uh, yeah, no, it, seriously, this makes up for the fact that Morrigan has enormous amounts of underboob. We pretend that it's magic that holds up her tits. Um, <laughs> Morrigan, Morrigan is snarky and she's weird and I totally fancied her. I mean, my character fancied her. No, yeah, uh, I'm probably just gonna be using I from now on. Take it to me and my character. So I do her personal quest in the game, which involves killing a dragon, uh, who is also Morrigan's mother, Ari, the aforementioned issues. Um, so I mean, come on, it's a pretty big deal, right? Okay, so I kill her mother dragon in a totally not creepy Freudian slash Greek tragedy way. Um, go back to camp and have the conversation with Morrigan, where I think I'm about to confess my love and embark on an epic shape-shifting dragon-killing romance. And Morrigan gets all teary and awkward and shy and says the immortal words, I little thought I would find in you a friend. Perhaps even a sister. Yeah, seriously, what? What the hell? Morrigan, I killed a dragon for you? Those are not the actions of a friend, okay? <laughs> Fucking hell. So anyway, <laughs> I remember being genuinely enraged, baffled. All of the cues in the game pointed to the beginning of this epic romance and instead of shagging in a tent, I got a friendship bracelet. What the hell? So I do what any sensible geek would do when faced with an insurmountable romantic problem. I looked it up on the wiki. Um, and I found out that while, yes, Morrigan is indeed a romance option in Origins, she can only be romanced by a male warden. And I, of course, am playing a female warden. So I went through st several stages of grief here at this point. Yeah, denial. No way would Bioware lock off an entire character based on your protagonist's gender. I mean, come on, I must have missed a flirt option somewhere. Anger, how dare they make the Morrigan romance only available to male wardens? Bargaining, come on, Bioware. Are you seriously trying to tell me that a forest-dwelling sorceress who spends most of her time shape-shifting into animals isn't at least by curious? <laughs> Depression, that's the stage where I turned off my console and went and wrote poetry in my live journal, which I definitely... <laughs> definitely don't still have and you'll never find because I didn't use my real name. Well done, teenage me. Uh, acceptance. Okay, so for me, acceptance sort of um, took the shape of rage romancing Alistair, um, who is a, a fellow Grey Warden who turns out to be the bastard son of the King of Ferelden. So, you know, I buried my heartbreak in over not getting to have the possibly evil woman who's the love of my life by getting Alistair to fall in love with me so that I could become the queen. Um, I may have had to manipulate him into having a, dra a demon baby with Morrigan, but sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. 
So now I've done the, the silly whinging bit of my, of my Morrigan talk, I also want to address something here. So while I've been joking about getting angry and having my heart broken and throwing all my toys out the pram, the fact that Morrigan didn't return my affections in the game made my game story better. Um, instead of a whitewashed fairy tale of a selfless champion falling in love with a noble king, I got to play a scorned, bitter, ruthless manipulator who shagged her way to the top of a kingdom. Um, the game might have expected my warden to be Snow White, but it gave me all the pieces I need to play the evil queen instead. But to get to that point, I had to loosen my grip. I had to accept that some things are out of my control. I am not owed a romance with Morrigan. So... Matt Bock gave a great talk at GDC this year. Um, it's one of the micro talks um, where he talks where he talks about games as entitlement simulators. That the stories and mechanics and characters of games are often designed to give us exactly what we want uncritically. So the NPCs in games generally only exist to cater to the protagonist. They're there to provide plot points and motivation and to fall into the protagonist's arms as a reward for doing whatever. I kept thinking about this point and I realized it's true more often than not. When's the last time a game character lied to you or denied you something? Oh wait, Morrigan. The fact that Morrigan denies you, the fact that her sexuality belongs to her and rather than to you, is something to be valued. If games are entitlement simulators, then Morrigan's refusal to bang you is an act of political and mechanical protest. The very fact that she can just be not that into you gives Morrigan the agency and internality and interest that 99% of NPCs out there lack. So, okay, moving on. Dragon Age 2. It's totally not better. So, um, yeah, there are, there are five romantic options in Dragon Age 2. There are only three we need to talk about. Anders, um, a mage possessed by the spirit of justice who occasionally gets all glowy-eyed and kills people. Fenris, uh, a runaway slave with tattoos that occasionally get glowy and then he kills people. There's maybe a theme here. <laughs> and Isabella a pirate captain who's actually the most sensible romantic option because she's not possessed. Um, she isn't obsessed with vengeance. She doesn't feed her blood to creepy magical artifacts. Uh, yeah. Uh, and she hasn't sworn a vow of chastity. Sebastian, seriously. Um, also, she has her own boat. Uh, so what's, what's great about all three of these romances is that each of these characters stymies the main character in some way. Fenris breaks up with you after you sleep together for the first time. Um, no, it does come back if you say and do the right things. It's also entirely possible to break off the romance entirely, um, especially if you shag someone else in the meanwhile. <laughs> yeah, I didn't do that at all. <laughs> But this is just another example of the game gently pulling control away from the player. So with Isabella, it's even more marked. Even if you're in a relationship with her, Isabella actually runs away and abandons you after a plot twist in Act 2. And it's possible that she never comes back. She leaves permanently, ending all possibility of your romance. And even if she does return, you have to deal with the consequences of her betrayal, her independent action, and whether you want to take her back and try and make it work. And of course, the most dramatic example of this in the game is Anders, who, whether he's in a relationship with you or not, chooses his political ideals over personal loyalties. Some of you are laughing because you've played this game. Um, and he commits an act of terrorism that starts a war. It's a great moment in the game. You sort of start suspecting that he's lying and sneaking around, and instead of finding out that he's having an affair, he uh, turns out to have been plotting a terrorist atrocity. Um, so what I love about this is that there's no way to stop him or convince him out of it or even find out what he's planning, no matter how many times you shag and not even if you move him into your fancy mansion. And if you're romancing him, the other characters give you a hard time about the fact that your boyfriend is a secret terrorist. <laughs> right? Which, I mean, understandable. But his actions, his actions reflect on you because you choose to romance him. And so usually the game protagonist's actions ripple out into the world. And the entire game is often about seeing the consequences of your choices play out. But in this instance, you're the one stuck having to cope with and deal with the consequences of an NPC's actions. So what this 
as well is begin to move us away from a goal-oriented conception of romance, where you win a romance by getting the character to sleep with you. But in Dragon Age 2, shacking up isn't the end of your story, it's the beginning. I know it sounds pretty out there, but the game gives you content and dialogue and quests with a character even after you've slept with them. Almost as if one shag doesn't tell you everything you need to know about a person in perpetuity. I guess if these romances have a win state, it's staying together. For me, this is one of the most interesting things about Dragon Age 2, and why I have a real soft spot for it, I think it gets unfairly maligned. Okay, the third act is pretty rushed. Um, but it's a milestone for the treatment of relationships in games. All of these characters do the unexpected. They act contrary to the interests and goals of the protagonist, and the experience is richer because of it. Okay, so I have no idea how I'm doing on time, but presumably all right. But let's, uh, let's really, talk about, really quickly talk about Inquisition. So again, for me, the best thing about Inquisition is the way in which every single character, ally, or romance option manages to surprise me in this game. It's not easy to do. Usually in a game, you're lucky if a character has text, much less subtext. Um, but it's also a game in which the, the game in which Bioware doubled down on the idea of their characters having particular non-negotiable preferences, not just in terms of their sexuality, but also in terms of their, well, race, but actually species. Um, this called Tumblr to ask the immortal question, is it racist that a particular elf character is only attracted to other elves? The short answer is no. The longer answer is eh, but it's definitely... <laughs> But it's definitely more racist that only human female wardens could marry Alistair and become queen in Dragon Age Origins, but no one seemed to give a shit about that. So this is actually kind of a good time to go back to Morrigan and maybe unpick the personal and the political a little bit more. I joked about how I wasn't entitled to Morrigan's love, but I did kind of sidestep a larger issue. I might not be entitled to a particular video game character's love, but I am entitled to have my preferences represented. We, as a video game consuming community, note how I didn't use gamers there, um, are entitled to have diversity, variety, and inclusivity across all of our video game romance options. And there's genuinely a tension to be negotiated, I think. A balance between representation and pandering, between politics and the individual, between giving the player what they want and being true to life. While one perhaps simple answer might be to make everyone bisexual, that kind of erases gay and lesbian identities. It's an easy solution, but not the right one. You don't always get to have the one you want, even if they are the perfect shape-shifting sorceress for you. So let's, uh, let's, let's finish this up by speed dating very quickly through Inquisition's romance options. Right, so Cassandra, total flirt, doesn't do women, no idea. <laughs> Dorian, apparently it's a spoiler that he turns out to be gay. The real spoiler is that it's not a spoiler at all. <laughs> You know this to be true. Okay, Blackwall, right? So I, uh, I ended up breaking up with Blackwall before I realized we were in a relationship. I thought we were having a bit of fun and maybe flirting, and then Blackwall gave me the classic tortured hero, we can't do this, I'm too dangerous for you, and have too dark a past speech. Um, so we agreed to stay friends. <laughs> This is Sarah. Uh, Sarah was my infuriating BFF, and I was not going to bring romance into such a beautiful frenemy ship. Uh, Iron Bull. Okay. So, Iron Bull is played by Freddie Prince Jr. Look, the teenage version of me that definitely didn't rewatch She's All That 200 times would have never forgiven me if I didn't try and romance Iron Bull. But despite some pretty full on flirting and more cock jokes than I thought they could actually get into a game, um, I could not get this romance going. So I went to the wiki. Um, and apparently, apparently, you have to kill a dragon before he gets interested in you. Seriously. I learned my lesson. <laughs> no more killing dragons to try and get a shag. It never works out. 
So, uh, Josephine, so if you squint at Josephine too hard, you wake up married in some kind of terrifying whirlwind storybook romance. Just a warning, no. <laughs> Solus, right? So, uh, I wasn't elfy enough to date Solus. See earlier bit. Um, probably a good thing, I'm sparing you all the spoilers. All right, so here we go. And this is the last one, so here's my confession. I totally romance Cullen. Okay, don't judge me, don't judge me. Apparently, amongst all the variety of romantic options, I picked the white dude with a terrible secret. But you know what? If suffering through all the heartbreaks and bad romances of the Dragon Age games have taught me anything about love, and it has, it's that when you find a romantic interest that isn't going to secretly blow up, blow up a church or make you kill a dragon to prove your love, you're on to a winner. And that's my talk. Thank you.